Well, a very warm welcome to everybody. We're glad that you're able to join us for our Work With Purpose online session today. We are able to gather around the conversation of straddling two worlds, and we're going to be hearing from a Seminary's experience of her journey with the value of Work With Purpose themes. Uh, we're grateful to be able to have Julie Burns, who will be with us today, sharing on uh, this important conversation. Uh, just real quick to introduce who I am. I, my name is Justin Irving. I've been here at Bethel for about 17 years now, provide leadership for the Doctor of Ministry program, teach in the area of ministry leadership, and I uh, have the honor of working in this area that we call Work With Purpose. I want to just give you a brief overview of uh, kind of what we're doing in this conversation about work with purpose and why work matters. And we should be thinking about this from a Christian uh, perspective. So what is work with purpose? Uh, we're an initiative here at Bethel Seminary. It's really targeting, uh, empowering and equipping the church to effectively engage in the ministry of everyday life and everyday work. When you think about where people spend a majority of their lives as followers of Christ, it involves what uh, some people estimate up to 100,000 hours that people spend in the context of their everyday work. And so we at Bethel Seminary are wanting to engage our students uh, who are serving in future pastoral and ministry roles, as well as uh, people who are currently engaged in pastoral ministry in the church, to be thinking about what does whole life discipleship that takes into consideration not only what happens on a Sunday morning or on a small group, community group kind of environment, but how do people live as whole life disciples in the whole of their lives? Family life context, neighborhood context, school context, and of course, the conversation around work as well. Well, one person who has had a lot of experience of engaging this theme uh, is Julie Burns. Uh, Julie is a, a student here in our Master of Divinity program and has had experience in sort of both sides of this conversation. She comes with experience in the corporate world and also experience in uh, being both a member and a leader in the church context as well. And we're going to hear her journey about integrating and straddling these two worlds as she has thought about her own work with purpose and how we engage others in this conversation. So at this point, I'll invite Julie to jump on board and uh, uh, enter the conversation. We're very glad that you're with us today, Julie, and look forward to what you have to share with us. Let me just make one, one more comment to those who are joining with us today. You'll notice that there is the uh, the chat box that people have been sharing their greetings on. And uh, after Julie is done sharing with us today, uh, you'll have an opportunity to engage with some comments or questions after. So if there's something that Julie triggers in your thinking about this conversation about work with purpose, be ready to jump on in with a question and Thanks, uh, Julie Justin. and I will we have uh, a enjoy mutual admiration those society at the end this time. So Julie, um, uh, I'm welcome. thrilled to be here. Uh, I'm today a big fan and, of yours. Uh, and... I actually shared these thoughts with the seminary staff um, about six weeks ago now. And that prompted Justin to ask me to do this for those of you who are with us today. Um, it's been very exciting for me to be able to engage in a lot of the activities of Work With Purpose while I've been in seminary the last uh, three and a half years. And I have about 72 days left to graduation, not that I'm counting. But I wanted to share with you today a little bit of my personal story. I came to Christ at a very young age. And by the time that I was 17, I went on my first ever missions trip. Um, to, uh, after, or actually it was overseas, but during the summer that I did that, I felt a strong calling and a strong desire to become a missionary to Africa. I know, it probably makes me a little bit strange, but that was a heart desire. And um, as things would evolve and develop, uh, it became clear where the Lord wanted me to go to university. That became a secular university, a state school, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. And while I was there, it turned out to be a wonderful thing because the Lord got me involved in InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And through my time with InterVarsity, I developed all kinds of leadership skills and de developed a passion for discipleship, lots of different things spiritually that were very, very beneficial for me. I went to the Urbana Conference, which fed my passion and desire to be a missionary. But it was my senior year of college that InterVarsity offered a... Um, 
a conference, and I think it was the only time they ever offered this conference. It was in Chicago. We met in the downtown arena in a fancy hotel, and the conference was called Marketplace 1986. At that conference, I was introduced to business people and people in a wide variety of industries and professional engagements who were Christians that had a deep passion to share the love of Jesus Christ in their work environments and saw their work as a calling. This was a very new idea for me and actually resonated very deeply in my heart because I was struggling. I was really struggling. Um, while I was at uh, the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire and involved in InterVarsity my senior year, I was offered the opportunity to join the InterVarsity staff as a campus worker. And there was some appeal in that because it was an opportunity to get into ministry, but I kept wrestling with the fact that I would be preparing students to enter what I called at the time the real world. And I wouldn't have had any of that experience myself. I also was wrestling because I felt like the Lord had made it clear I was supposed to pursue a degree in finance and French. My minor was French and my actual major was uh, finance. Naively, I thought that might get me into an international business experience opportunity. Um, but I had this degree, I had this training, and I was really kind of interested in getting into banking. And I really had a desire to be a banker as well as to be a missionary. And I was having a hard time sorting that out. So while at this conference in December of 1986, for the first time probably ever, I was exposed to business people, uh, political people, education people, people in all kinds of walks of life that saw their life calling as a call to the marketplace. This was exciting and this resonated um, with some of the things that I was personally wrestling with. So I said no thank you to the InterVarsity opportunity and instead I chose to go into banking. And that got me started on the which way should I go. So my journey of work started as a commercial lender with what is now called US Bank. I did that for about six years and I loved my work, but I also found it very challenging. I went into it with a tremendous excitement to make a difference for Jesus in the marketplace. I wanted to be a person of integrity and I wanted to connect with the lost and make, um, make a bridge so people could cross over. One of the things that I discovered is that that's not so easy. I was very humbled at the challenge of being salt and light in the workplace in ways that really reached out to people and really made a conduit so people could encounter Jesus Christ in a real way. One of the things I discovered in that time is that I had something I would now call a holy huddle. My idea of reaching the marketplace was that looks sort of something like this. I go to church, I go to small group activities, I'm involved in um, leadership at my church, and I do all kinds of things at church when I'm not at work. And when I'm at work, I attempt to reach out to people and I invite them to activities at church. Well, one of the things that happened for me is that I realized I did not have an invitational pathway. When I did that, people didn't say yes. People always said no. And I began to be very discouraged and to feel like what I was doing wasn't working and that I was a failure at evangelism. Later, the Lord would reveal to me through another set of circumstances that I wasn't invitational, that I was really more testimonial and relational. But the only way I discovered that is that I began to understand that Jesus was a friend of sinners. And the Lord started to speak into my life while I moved into my next season, which was full-time motherhood. It was in that time that I experienced some conviction and the Lord spoke to me about the fact that I wasn't an effective evangelist or missionary right in my own neighborhood. And why did I think I could be one in Africa? Well, while I was a full-time mom and I reached this point of conviction, uh, the Lord opened some doors as I cried out for him to make a change in my life. If I'm not effective, Lord, I want to be effective. Can you move me? Do something in my life that gets me busy for Jesus in a way that really reaches lost people and isn't just doing business in the church. Well, through that heart cry and that desperate prayer, the Lord began to use me to reach some of my neighbors um, for Christ. I, and a neighborhood outreach ministry developed in that time where quite a few women came to know Christ. We impacted their children and their husbands. That ministry continues to this day, even though I left there in 2005. Um, because that ministry developed in my life, I then began to experience some opportunity in the church. And I was invited to take a ministry role in the women's ministry in a mega church environment. Our church was about 7,000 people. Our women's ministry was about 1,300 or so on a given week. And there was a need to develop the outreach aspect of the church ministry. And so the Lord took what he was doing in my personal life and he moved it into the church context. And eventually I became the director of the women's ministry there and built a team to do more outreach and to train women to make a difference right where they were. And this is when I began to understand that part of our calling isn't always to go, it's to make a disciple right where we are. 
And this was also tied into this idea that you might be called into the marketplace and that your, your unique context might be in the secular marketplace. Eventually, we moved to the St. Cloud area here in Minnesota, and I became the director of spiritual formation for a church plant. Well, all while this was happening, um, and actually during the time that I joined church staff, one of the things that I discovered is that working at a church isn't really nirvana. I think for a time when I was in the marketplace, I thought, well, maybe it would just be easier if I had a job in the church. Well, one of the things I learned while I was in the church and in um, ministry context is that it's work. It's work, too. So when I was in the church and in con ministry contests, we had some of the same questions. What happens when there's a lack of organizational alignment? Who knows where we're going as an organization and why we're going there? What do I do with the conflict that just bubbled in the church office? How can I handle the personal temptations, the trust that's given to me and the temptations that the Satan, that the evil one might put in front of me on a given day? What do I do if I have a boss that isn't pulling his or her weight? Or what about my customers, the people in the ministry who might be continually complaining and groaning and mumbling? What about a coworker who lacks the skills or the passion or the motivation to do what he or she is supposed to be doing? Sometimes I ask the question, where did the joy of ministry go? I had asked that question at the bank some days. What am I doing here? And I would lose track of my vision. Well, all by this was happening, and I was beginning to make um, a career, if you will, out of um, vocational ministry, my husband was firmly planted in the secular marketplace. He's worked in the printing industry for many, many years now, and he's moved around and had lots and lots of different leadership roles. And one of the most ironic things that happened to me is that I discovered at the dinner table, we were having some of the same conversations and struggling with some of the same issues when it came to leadership and the workplace and the challenge of work. And so we would discuss things at the kitchen table like personal future, or excuse me, personal virtue. Um, what about our calling and finding meaning in our work? What about the meaningful expression of our faith in the workplace? One of the funniest things that can happen in the church is we can be so busy doing work for God that we forget to talk with one another about him and to encourage one another. It wasn't as different from what my husband was experiencing in the marketplace as I thought. Um, what about finding support and mutual encouragement as we're doing the things that we believe God is calling us to? Or what about dealing with a lack of a sense of achievement? My goals aren't getting accomplished like I thought they would be. What about my attitude or setting vision and maintaining a healthy course? Well, through this time, <clears throat> essentially what happened as I was in a church staff situation, I began to see some general insensitivity on the part of the church through the eyes of my husband who was working in the marketplace and a regular faithful participant in church life. I saw some things that were happening in the church that didn't seem to reckon with the fact that my husband had a calling to the marketplace, just like I had a calling into the church. Imagine my joy at one of my first Work With Purpose experiences where Tom Nelson, who was the author of Work Matters, started to talk about some very powerful things that can happen in the workplace. What about the Christian who is in the workplace and truly is making an affect, who's affecting the system? What about thinking through the overlapping networks of church members' lives and work? Who are the people they know and who are the people they're interacting with? And what are those overlapping networks like? And how can we leverage those networks to make a difference in the marketplace? <clears throat> what about somebody who brings excellence? A Christ follower who brings excellence into the marketplace and provides greatness and influences that pocket. How are we as the church getting behind that person and supporting them and praying for them and encouraging them? Tom mentioned that when the righteous flourish, the city rejoices. It's from the scriptures. Those who do honest work make an honest profit and can serve others generously. This was outstanding. This was like fruit and light and water and a refreshing drink for me. Um, one of the things I had seen is that as my husband functioned as a professional, which means he had a lot of hours in the workplace. He was questioned by people in the church for being a workaholic. Did he have his priorities in the right place? Why wasn't he at all the church meetings? Why was he always at work? Or why was he given his primary energy to work? There were assumptions about his motives for his work. Was he just greedy? Was he just trying to be rich? Um, that wasn't my husband's heart that I saw. My husband had a heart to be a man of God 
in the workplace and to lead as a man of God and to respect and honor and care for the people that were under him. He had hundreds of people in his care. I saw the church demonstrating sometimes an interest in a businessman because he had money to give and he had skill sets. Could he be on a certain board because he knew how to manage money? Could he be on a stewardship council because he knew how to manage money? And there's nothing inherently wrong with those desires, but they were out of balance. Something about the church was out of kilter. There was something about the paradigm that wasn't working right. I saw the church planning meetings that were not sensitive to the working person's schedule, wanting to do a leadership retreat away on a Thursday and Friday, which meant that the leaders of our church had to take two days of vacation to come engage with us. Once in a while, maybe, but maybe that was inappropriate. And I saw the church leaders saying, well, we don't want to do a retreat on Saturday because that's inconvenient for us. We have to preach on Sunday. So there were just insensitivities, general insensitivities that I saw. Well, this frustration ended up serving as fuel for me. It led me to start asking. Um, I needed to change some things about my own paradigms and my own perspective. So I began to ask church members about their five-day-a-week investments. What do you do? How is it going? What are your latest victories? How can I pray for you in your work? And how could I be an encouragement to you in the day-to-day -day grind? Because we all know the world is, it, the marketplace is a sinful, broken place, whether we're in the Christian world or whether we're in the secular world. Could I meet you at your office and have lunch with you? Could we just talk about what you do and who you do it with? I would love to see where and with who we work. And I started to challenge the staff gently to reconsider the timing of meetings and retreats and to consider the asks of our, men, of our members and leaders. How many nights a week are we asking people to be at church? Work with Purpose has spoken and challenged so many of the sort of typical paradigms that we have in the church. Catherine Leary Alsdorf uh, really did a great job of challenging the sacred and secular divide when she quoted Kuiper who said, in the total expanse of human life, there's not a single square inch into which or of which Christ who alone is sovereign does not declare, that's mine. And she challenged the pastoral sense of being out of touch. We had a sense that as a group of pastors, when we would meet to talk about these things, there was sort of this general idea, how can a pastor even speak to somebody in the marketplace? We don't have a clue. And she said to us, do you work? Are there challenges where you work? And that really kind of resonated with what I'd been experiencing. The church isn't nirvana. People in the church are still imperfect people. When we come into the office, the staff at my mega church was 185 people. We were a church staff and we had staff issues and staff problems and vision problems. I had begun to experience that, but somehow I had lost track of the fact that I was working in a work context, just like my fellows who were working in the, in the secular arena were working in a marketplace. They challenged our tendency to equip people for church work only. I was reminded that when Jesus said that we were to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the harvest field, that doesn't mean we were looking for workers to come work in the church nursery. We're looking and asking God to provide workers in the harvest field. Have I kept my, my sense of that? The gift of work with purpose also helped redefine some aspects of church. Are the people here for the church or is the church here for the people? We tend to make the church the engine and we want everybody to come to the engine. What if we saw the church truly as the launch pad and not the center? What if we reminded ourselves that the pastor's role is to be an equipper? Leith Anderson said at one of the first meetings I went to, 97% of Christians could not remember a single sermon on work. Ouch. That's where they're spending most of their life. Are we teaching to that? Are we encouraging to that? Are we walking alongside them in that? Leith really challenged me. And he talked about a required, in, uh, a required change in infrastructure. I think our tendency in the church sometimes is to say we're short here. Let's, let's run a new program. Let's do something new and lay it on top of what we're already doing. And I was challenged that we really need to think about changing our ultimate infrastructure, our actual DNA. And the Work With Purpose program has, has offered up several people who are doing this effectively. And they've spoken to me at different times through online discussions and through talks they've done about some very practical ways to engage this. Tom Nelson did that. J.D. Larson did that from Mill City Church. Robert Olszewski, who has a church in, um, in Stillwater here in Minnesota. It's really engaging to begin to work with people in their workplace and to empower and encourage them and equip them to make a difference there. 
Tom Nelson also gave us important cautions. It's so easy too as us, for us as leaders to go off one edge or the other edge. And he said, we need to be careful. We need to not overcorrect and suggest that work alone matters. The Christian life is more robust and more rounded than that. Or, we, or to diminish the importance of gospel proclamation. Many of our speakers talked about living the life and living with integrity and all kinds of things, but it's easy to forget that we also need to voice the gospel in our workplace. And Tom said, let's not forget that. That's important too. We also need to be careful that we don't fall into idolizing work and making work everything. There was a reboot on pastoral staff sensitivity issues. How, what kind of stories are we telling? What kind of examples? We need to broaden our thinking about the people in the pew and write, write our sermons and give our teaching with their context in mind, not just the pastor's life or the pastor's family, but that person in the pew. What is their daily life? How can I write my applications and my illustrations in a way that draw them in and help them to, to realize that I'm thinking about their life and I'm not disconnected to what they're living with every day, even if it's coming secondhand from talking to the people in the pew. We need to um, meet and retreat on sensitive time schedules. We need to adjust ministry expectations and not ask the people who are really seeing their calling as a calling to the marketplace to also be giving 40 hours a week at the church. Um, we also need to think about our choice of role models, the people we put up front on a Sunday morning and in our ministries. Who are the heroes we're elevating? And are we speaking about people who are living and breathing and working and making a difference in the marketplace as part of how we are applying the scriptures on an ongoing basis in the church. Leith also said, work beaks people up for six days. The church needs to bring life and hope, not more guilt. One of the most painful things that happened for me sometimes was to go to church with my spouse or with my children and to see the church laying another bunch of shoulds on top of what they're already feeling are shoulds on a day-to-day -day existence. That's not helpful. Dr. Vogt, Amy Sherman, Andy Crouch, and Tom Nelson all have given and provided a very robust view of the scriptures, a view that started with Genesis 1 and ended with Revelation 22, that recognized that work is part of the creation experience. It's not something that we start with in Genesis 3. So often we focus on the fall and work. But they started with work and the idea that we're called to be co-creators, image bearers, representing Christ in all places in work and society as we exercise the privilege of dominion. This was awesome to just elevate work back to, up to a level of what God intended it to be. I've been around my culture so long and watched the workplace be maligned as the thing we get out of, we seek to escape. We've become a culture that emphasizes vacation and recreation and escape and sees work as the drudger we do, we do just to make the money to get away and do the things that are really life. What if God really designed us to work and to work creatively and to work with energy and joy and to find satisfaction, albeit in an imperfect world? We're not ignoring the fall in our work with purpose emphasis, but we're putting some perspective back that's more robust about what God intended work originally to be. What if the work itself matters? What if it does? What if what I did at the bank actually mattered not just because I was telling somebody about Jesus there? but because I was contributing to a functioning society by being a godly worker with integrity who showed up on time and did her work with excellence and cared about the task and cared about the people, the customer, the coworker, the boss. It was more robust than I was used to thinking about. Most recently, I just added this actually, Neil Hudson came from the London Institute of Contemporary Christianity and he gave a refreshing and helpful and actually quite simple definition of discipleship. A disciple is someone learning to live the way of Jesus in their context at this moment. That resonates with Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching. Those three uh, participial phrases, going, baptizing and teaching, are secondary to the main, the main objective, which is to make disciples. And he's reminding us through this simple definition, wherever you go, wherever you baptize, wherever you teach, Grow and learn and flourish and make the best of where God has you. What if everybody in the pew really understood that and could really embrace that calling Monday through Friday so that Monday through Friday wasn't torture, but it was the place of their context of their calling. And then he brought about what he called his six M's, a personal frame of fruitfulness. 
What if every day in the marketplace we all chase these six M's, whether I'm sitting in my class at Bethel Seminary, whether I'm, I, I'm in a church staff meeting, or whether I'm at the bank doing the job that I'm called to do at the bank. What if I was making good work, modeling good character, ministering grace and love, molding culture, a mouthpiece for truth and justice, and a messenger of the gospel? I think this is a robust vision for what work could be. And last but not least, some have talked about human flourishing and helped us get a, a, a theology that looks at work all the way up to the level of human flourishing as the highest goal. How does that intersect with my pastoral role? What if order plus abundance equals flourishing and utility plus beauty equals flourishing and every one of us in every kind of a context looked at our role every day with a call to bring order and abundance, to make the best utility to, to make the best functioning thing or activity we could possibly do and combine that with creative energy and beauty and bring about flourishing. Wouldn't that be exciting? And there are distortions. We have distortions in our way of thinking about authority. Those in leadership get entrusted with authority, again, whether it's in the church or in the marketplace. And how do we use that authority in a way that's God-honoring? What if that's really laying it down and being a servant instead of lording it over people? regardless of what your context is. There's a call to vulnerability. Jesus asks us to be a servant, to humble ourselves and to lay ourselves down. What if all of us, marketplace or church context, understood laying down our authority and, and, and embracing our vulnerability? All of that can lead to fruitfulness, image-bearing, Christ-likeness. And it's a little bit countercultural and a little bit strange for us. But these are many of the ideas that have really affected me as I've been at seminary and as I've had this opportunity to engage very frequently and very deeply with, um, with the Work With Purpose program. So the personal ministry impact can be summed up in a number of key things for me. I gained a more robust vision. I've listened to many, many educated voices, people who have written books from a lot of different angles on this issue. And we've attached a bibliography at the end of this presentation with some of the key materials that I think are invaluable. And all of us need to be responsible for the rest of our lives, whether we're seminary students or not, to continue to be educated. So if you've not read some of these books, I'd encourage you to read them and let them affect the way you view your own work and the work of the people that you're ministering to, regardless of your context. I've also come to know a number of friendly faces. These people who've written these books are accessible people and they're ready and willing to engage. There are people here at Bethel that are ready and willing to engage us in our context to make a difference so that we can reach that worker that's in the marketplace. They're available. Teddy Ann Hassapopoulos is one of those people. Tessa Pinkstaff, Justin Irving. They're available to you to help you make your ministry more sensitive. I also gained an online network through the Theology of Work Project. If you've not ever looked into that, Theology of Work Project is an excellent place to go to get resources by a group of theologians who spent many, many years figuring out how the Bible looks at work from start to finish. That is a monster resource that I will use continually as a pastor. There have been extensive resources, and there is a Made to, Pl uh, Made to Flourish Pastors Network here in the Twin Cities, but I believe that network exists off and on all over the country. So wherever you're in ministry, you can become a part of a group of people who are thinking about this and seeking to apply this and embrace this in their church and other ministry contexts. I hope that you will, in the time that you're involved at seminary or um, whatever brings you to this forum today, that you will engage in work with purpose and that you will receive personally and professionally the benefits that have come to me. Um, I am thanking God for work with purpose as I'm coming to the end of my time here at seminary. I don't want you to miss out. So thanks for your attention um, to my personal story. And I think at this point, we're open to whatever kinds of questions you might have. We realize you're on uh, lunch hour, many of you, and want to be sensitive Julie, to your time. Julie, thank you so much but for uh, uh, walking us through your, your journey of straddling these two worlds and how um, the various voices that you've heard from over the years helped to, to validate and affirm not only what you're doing now as a seminary student, but what you did in the various other phases of your work life from the banking industry and beyond. Um, at this point, let me just 
uh, remind folks that this is the time that we're going to be uh, taking some questions. If you would like to interact with Julie, uh, please feel free to, to uh, share any comments or questions in the chat box and we'll engage those. Uh, I'll maybe kick things off with a question for you, Julie, here. Uh, you had a couple themes uh, in your time with us that you were sharing, really kind of this distinction between what I'll, I'll sometimes label as the intrinsic value of work versus the utilitarian value of work. You even share that about kind of your husband's experience at times of when people are coming to a business person thinking that they uh, are a source for uh, resources or money for a ministry or a nonprofit, but not really be val being validated for the work itself. And sometimes uh, as workers, uh, we bring that, own, uh, that, that rubric to our own work as well, and we live by this sort of TGIF sort of mindset of uh, how do we get beyond our work, whether it's the week weekend or retirement or vacations and on and on down the line. We, we have a fall-oriented view of work. So speak to us a little bit about the intrinsic value of work. Why is that important for churches and Christians to be speaking not only about how work brings about other goods, but that the work itself matters to God and God's people? One of the things that I've been thinking more and more about is um, the fact that we all have these unique skills and abilities and capabilities, and those are given to us and put into us by God himself, and that's not accidental. So um, one of the young women I came to know in the last few years has incredible creative graphic design skills, and she has used those skills in a number of different um, contexts. Those skills have allowed her to bring order, to bring beauty, to bring creativity. Um, it, specifically in my world, she worked with me on my most recent church staff position. She brought beauty and um, enriched the things that I was doing. She brings, um, she works to bring um, a common look and a common feel to people's marketing. She's actually now doing that here at Bethel. Um, and she's a really gifted person. So for her to be able to think when she goes home at night, I have contributed to society. I have made a difference. I have enriched the workplace. I have given benefit. My husband has had responsibility for literally 300 people's employment recently. There's value in that. There's value in providing an opportunity for somebody to use their skills and abilities somebody who knows how to run a printing press, somebody who's a fantastic custodian, somebody who is a terrific HR manager, to have a place to use those skills and to bless the world. That doesn't even speak to the product. When I was a banker, I made loans. Those loans allowed companies to do what companies needed to do. And that was my contribution to a society, whether those organizations were Christian organizations or secular organizations. Making those loans allowed them to buy equipment or to build buildings and also to provide employment. So there's all these things we do that are contributing to the flourishing of society as a whole. One of my most exciting things that has just happened is that my son just graduated with his degree and he has just started working um, in a manufacturing context in Kansas City, Missouri. And when I went to visit him at his workplace the very first time, I heard him saying what I would hope to hear from him. As he was describing his workplace, he started telling us, my husband and I, about the products he makes and why those products are valuable to the world in which we live today. And I thought, yay, he knows how he's contributing to the larger culture. And that gives a different view to what he's doing when he's managing logistics and making sure a truck gets from point A to point B in time. There's a bigger picture. So I don't know if that answers your question, but those are the kinds of things that I think... Um, we as the church can help people understand they're contributing to a much bigger world out there than just their little niche on a given day. It's about uh, plumbers uh, who are Christians, but he also cares about uh, people having sanitary living conditions that they can, uh, within which they can thrive. So the work itself matters in, in numerous expressions. We've got a couple good questions that have uh, emerged here. One was uh, from Jessica and highlighting a shift that she went through from a, uh, you know, sort of a quote unquote secular environment. We use those secular sacred terms, I think, lightly, but, you know, working in a not explicitly Christian environment and shifting to a place like Bethel, uh, 
that is a Christian workplace. And some of the opportunities for outreach and uh, communicating her faith that, uh, that shifted as she moved from the secular environment to a Christian workplace. Uh, thoughts or advice that you would have to Jessica and others who have made those kinds of shifts? How do you, how do you live out this making a difference in a Christian-based work environment? Well, I, um, I would say one of the biggest things that I've had to realize is that um, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 talks about as we are going. So all of us have a lot of different circles. And one of the things that happens to us when we move into a Christian yeah. context for our vocation is that we can very quickly become um, disconnected from people who no longer know Christ. And so one of the things I've had to do as a professional minister is to make sure that I have other circles. When my children are young and they're engaged in school activities, uh, the Lord opens many, many doors because you have all these school-related activities by which to connect with other parents and families. We had children in our home all the time who didn't know the Lord. I, we were interacting with parents. My children are now gone. My neighbors are one of my best places to do that. So I'm very intentional about taking my dog for a walk and making sure that I engage and greet my neighbors. Um, I've pursued friendships with women that go back to those years when I um, had kids in school, but I continue to retain those relationships. I have to be much more intentional. But I also think we need to not underestimate the value of living out our Christ following right in the Christian context. So one of the things that happens to us, like I said, all too often in a Christian context is that we can be so busy about the tax the actual work we're doing that we lose track of the fact that we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I have had unending opportunities when I can tell somebody's having a bad day to invite them into my office and say, hey, what's up? And how can I pray for you? And to put my hand on my coworker's shoulder and pray for them right now today. Our coworkers in the in the arena that we find ourselves, whether it's the church or the seminary environment or um, whatever it might be, they're also disciples who are on the path to growing in Christ. So one of the things that's happened for me is that I've stopped drawing some kind of a hard line between evangelism and discipleship. I now look at people as being on the journey. They're all on the journey toward Christ-likeness, and we're all one place, and we're moving to the next place. And so I see my responsibility as a little broader than just um, than just making converts. I see my responsibility uh, Scott raises is a, to make a helpful disciples. question about very different the actual different church context, practices. He raises the, the comment about sermons. You know, would you have some examples of um, elements of a sermon that have helped parishioners think about the dimension of work? And I might just uh, expand that to say uh, sermons or other uh, liturgical church-based practices that help to integrate work reflection. Uh, uh, what comes to mind for you that would help Scott and others think about uh, bringing this theme to their own church context. Well, I had a I had an interesting opportunity. I did my internship this past fall, and I had an interesting opportunity. I don't remember all the details, but the sermon that I was preaching was um, essentially on the issue of power. And when I got to the application portion of the sermon. Um, I began to get really specific with uh, the congregants about what it would mean to lay down power and what it would mean to lift others up. So the humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. And in that sermon, I gave a couple specific work context examples. So what does it mean as a leader for you to lead your people well, but not to lord it over them? And we talked about some specific things. I brought up the idea of being on teams and what happens when you're on a team and there are people on the team that are constantly grabbing for um, the fame. They want to be known for their contributions, but you're on the team and you know that they're not doing it all, that you're in the background working your tail off and nobody's recognizing you. What happens in those settings? And are you willing to lay your uh, claim to power, your claim to fame down? What does it look like on a team to elevate the other team members, even when things aren't perfect because we know no team is perfect. And so I just laid out some of those really tricky workplace um, dynamics and moved along, finished the sermon. And the next week at staff meeting, uh, one of my coworkers said to me, Julie, Jacob loved your sermon. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, mm -hmm. we got out and we got in the car. And the first thing he said is, 
she like mm-hmm. called my circumstances. This is exactly, he's an engineer and he was on a team and he had a power grabber on the team and he was fighting with this sense of competition and wanting to prove that he was a contributor too. And now he had to think about what, what would Christ do in this situation? And mm-hmm. I'm not sure we would have, I'm not sure he would have applied it there if the Lord hadn't led me to bring up something that concrete. Um, so that's one, that's one example. Um, I think we have to know our people enough to know what their what their rubs are every week. What is the really hard place? My husband stands in an interesting gap in management between the people who are unionized and the power play that goes on with a union. And how do we cut through the power play of a union to care for these people and to respect the needs and the uh, the expectations mm-hmm. of management? Those are really tricky oh, places great, to Julie. think about. What yeah, does those it mean to lay my power examples down? Go a long way but still be a place looking of to godly apply influence. the wisdom of Scripture to their everyday lives. Um, one of my colleagues uh, here at Bethel, uh, an Old Testament professor, when when he was preaching regularly, he would he would oftentimes uh, go through a process of preparing a portion of the sermon, but then meet with somebody in their workplace midweek to kind of run by how the sermon preparation was going and how that connected to their own workplace context. So I think your your model of kind of weaving intentionally those examples in. And uh, and uh, just a, a reminder of uh, having other practices about that you even noted meeting regularly with people in their workplace can provide the um, on the ground insights of what what people are engaging in their lives of work and how that connects to the particular passage you're engaging on a given week. Uh, got another good question here. Noting that uh, I'm not currently employed uh, full-time with a church body, but I serve uh, all the time. And it's very evident that the church staff can sometimes display the attitude of being staff, that being staff is a quote-unquote a job. You had highlighted that kind of it's work reality in your experience, Julie. Well, this it's feeling like a job, and because of that, they get caught up. Um, into this rather than displaying it as a sense of their calling or uh, being called to purpose. Mm-hmm. So a couple of questions then in light of that. How do you motivate church staff uh, 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 that what they contribute is for the greater good of the kingdom and it should be viewed in that manner? Uh, other than retreats, have you found anything more effective uh, than others in terms of building teams? Uh, so not just from that lead pastor, regular preaching-oriented kind of role, but uh, staff pastor roles. How do you stay motivated and focused in this way? Isn't that the big question for all of us? I think... Um... Like I mentioned, all too often the conversation at the dinner table at my house has been about losing focus and being discouraged. And in the world we live in, we all can get caught in the traps and the stumbles and the frustrations and the problems um, and lose lose the motivation, lose the vision. Uh, I think one of the best, the best sort of um, personally motivating books for me on this issue of, vo- of vocation has been... Um, the vision for vision for vocation book that uh, Stephen Garber wrote. Some people just know how to speak and how to remind us of the bigger calling and the bigger picture. Uh, I think we need to go back to the scriptures and we need to look at some of the models, the Daniels, for example, who was willing to lay it all aside, who was willing to eat the vegetables and give up on all the fancy living because he knew he had a purpose that was bigger. I think just studying some of those biblical models is a fantastic reminder. I was just, I've been in Moses preparing a sermon series in Deuteronomy and Thinking about Moses being on his face for 40 days interacting with God on behalf of those grumbling stiff-necked people, which happens to be us, um, reminding himself. We have a responsibility when we're in the ministry to remind ourselves and to remind one another that what we're doing is bigger than the task of the day. Um, I don't think there's any easy answers for that. It's it's going to the scriptures and being mindful of... um, And maybe it's praying together and reminding ourselves and coming along aside each other and encouraging each other. We can function in a church staff situation just like anywhere else. I go in, I do my business, I pack up and I go home and I try not to get into trouble with anybody else. 
building team and encouraging one another is a big part of that. That's a little bit back to the idea that I said, I think we're all called to be disciple makers no matter where we are. And if you're investing in your coworkers in a way that says, I want to see you grow in Christ and I, I'm expecting that you're going to keep me accountable we, and encourage me as well. Yeah, sometimes we, bring we can something assume deeper and more that robust because someone works at a church, they've really thought through the task. vocational edge to their calling. Sure uh, that there's a sense of, well, they're at a church. Of course, they're called to a broader kingdom purpose. Uh, but if we're not being intentional to have vocational stewardship conversations with people who are ministering in a church context and people who are ministering in business and other marketplace environments, we're not helping them to connect to that deeper sense of vocation and calling. Uh, so great, great questions there, Letha. Uh, we are getting to a, a time where uh, have maybe another question or two. I see a couple people typing away. Uh, we'll see when those pop up and, and engage some of them. But uh, really appreciate these insights that you've been providing for us, Julie. Uh, when you think of any final kind of last words that you'd like to uh, mention to us, uh, what would be helpful? Um, and I, I think uh, somebody said, what title? What was the title of the book you mentioned? Uh, I think it was Visions of Vocation by Stephen Garber. Is that the is that the case? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Letha, this, uh, Visions of Vocation is uh, just a really a great work. Go ahead, Julie. I would only offer... Sorry about that. I, I remembered something I shared with the seminary staff that I forgot to mention earlier um, today, and that is that I had one of my most recent work with purpose moments, if you will, um, was in January when I was uh, studying in Israel. And as it turned out, I was with quite a few Bethel University undergrad students. And I sat in the back of the bus one day with those students to interact with them in a more intentional fashion while we were on the road visiting places in Israel. And one of the young men said to me, um, Julie, can you answer a question for me? Can you help me with something? And I said, sure. And he said, I, I don't know. He said, but I'm, the, I, I'm really struggling because I'm getting close to being done with college and I've got this weird feeling like I'm coming to the end of the best part of life. I, I'm coming to the end of college and I don't know. It just seems like you get up and you grow up and you go off and you work and you work and you work and it's just not all that exciting. And inside, I just had one of those heart moments of, oh no, what have we done? What have we communicated to this young man who's 20, 21 years old that he thinks college is the best there is and that work is just going to be a daily miserable grind? And so I threw up my hands and I said, oh, no, 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 no. Let me tell you, God has a calling for every one of your lives. And he's working on um, some engineering things himself. And I said, There's, there can be deep and wonderful meaning in work. It's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect. But college isn't perfect either. And it's really exciting to grow up. It's wonderful to grow up. I said, Aiden, hey, you need to know that God created all of us to grow. That's how we're designed. The whole earth is growing. Animals grow. People grow. We're designed to grow. And moving into a professional work environment or growing up and taking your place in society is an exciting and wonderful thing. There's meaning and value in that. And I hope um, that you will experience that in some very rich and deep ways. It's imperfect. You're not going to have every day is not going to just be wonderful. But it's a good thing. And uh, we talked well, about Julie, it. Julie, I, I wow, think that's a, a, wonder, that a wonderful way and to I end thought, our oh, time well, because that, some work that really do. captures some work why it is so important for people who are leading and ministering in the church and beyond to get this conversation. How can we be proactive in validating that the life that people are living, both in and outside of the workplace, it matters. It matters to God. It matters from a kingdom perspective. It matters to the people that we're serving along the way. And uh, that story just illustrates the, the divine appointment that you had on in that particular conversation, but how that's needed uh, in terms of pastoral ministry and other contexts as well. So really appreciate your sharing with us that uh, insight. Uh, a couple quick announcements here as we draw our time to a close. Uh, if you are uh, in the St. Paul area, we do have a, an exciting event that's coming up in April with uh, Amy Sherman. And we are, uh, we're targeting a conversation over a, the lunchtime hour uh, entitled The Grand Narrative and Vocational Mission. 
Uh, Amy Sherman is uh, one of our uh, one of the key resources that we point people towards in her work, work Kingdom Calling. So uh, please come to our website. Uh, seminary.bethel.edu slash work with purpose and uh, check out that event. We would love to have uh, you participate in it. We also have a pastor's gathering that our uh, partners Made to Flourish are doing with Amy a little bit before that. We would encourage you to check into that. Uh, if you are in other locations, uh, I, I know some of you may be connected to uh, Bethel Seminary San Diego. Uh, we will also be having uh, significant events coming up that are being planned, particularly in the fall, with some uh, speakers. And uh, keep an eye out for those announcements for opportunities that will be happening in your region of the country as well. Here are some of those resources that uh, Julie and others mentioned. Uh, we point people to these regularly and they are listed on our website. But Every Good Endeavor by uh, uh, Keller and Leary Alsdorf, uh, Amy Sherman's Kingdom Calling, Tom Nelson's Work Matters, uh, Stephen Garber's Visions of Vocation, uh, which Julie highlighted for us a moment ago, Ann Crouch and his book Culture Making, and Neil Hudson, uh, Imagine Church. Powerful resources for anybody that would like to take the next step in exploring this important conversation. Uh, you don't need to read all of these. Just pick up one or two and start to wade into the waters and learn from these authors as they've thought significantly about the importance of work, not just from a practical perspective, from, but from the theological uh, foundations as well. <coughs> We are so grateful that you have joined us. Uh, if you are looking to find out more about Bethel Seminary, either for yourself or others, uh, we have a number of wonderful educational opportunities we'd encourage you to check out at seminary.bethel.edu. Work with Purpose has a number of resources available to you. Uh, we've heard from uh, great people like Julie and others, and we have recordings and uh, uh, TED Talk-like videos and, uh, and good resources, video and audio, that are available, and you can navigate to uh, at our website. And, of course, if you have any questions for Julie, Tessa, or myself, you can reach us at workwithpurpose at bethel.edu. Thank you so much for joining us, and Julie, we are very grateful for your investing this time with our participants today. God bless you, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.